the length to which their family will go to get good, good care for their child is unbelievable. If we can just make it like an iota of a, of a fraction of a, you know, care easier for these folks to get reimbursement, you know, that is available, but just today has so many hoops to jump through. Um, I think that's another example where the acquisition motion might be B to C, but the value proposition would be how do you help those consumers actually get access to reimbursed services versus having to pay out of pocket. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within. I say be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take those who take. Welcome to this week's Startup Health Fireside Chat where we host candid conversations with really some of the most forward-thinking minds in health innovation today uh, in front of a live interactive audience of founders from the Startup Health portfolio. Uh, I'm your host, Logan Plaster, and it's my pleasure this week to bring you a conversation with Julie Yu, General Partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Julie leads the firm's investments in health tech with a focus on companies that are modernizing how we access, how we pay for, and how we experience healthcare. Prior to Andreessen Horowitz, Julie was the co-founder of Kairos and VP of product at Generation Health in addition to a host of other positions. Before that, she studied computer science and pre-med at MIT, genomics at Harvard, and business at Sloan. So we'll barely get to scratch the surface on all of that experience, uh, Julie, but we will do our best. Uh, Julie, thank you for joining us for this week's Startup Health Fireside Chat. Thanks so much for having me, Logan. It's great to see some familiar faces in the crowd, so I appreciate folks showing up for this. And a reminder to everyone that we'll uh, kickstart the conversation uh, with a bunch of questions, but soon we're going to turn it over to your questions. So be thinking about how you want to take part in this conversation. Drop your questions into the chat, and when the time is right, I will invite you to take part in the conversation as well. And a reminder, come on video if you're able to, and make sure you rename yourself so Julie and I and everyone else knows who you are. So Julie, let's start a high level, let's start macro. You've been at Andreessen Horowitz for two years about, is that right? Is that around That's the right. right? I celebrated my two year anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. Happy birth, happy job, job anniversary. Uh, let's start top line with uh, an understanding of how the firm thinks about investing in health technology at that high macro level. What are some of your top line strategies right now for investing in opportunities that you think are gonna shape the future of health? At a baseline, and, and core to our model here at Andreessen Horowitz is that first and foremost, we are ex-founders, backing founders, trying to be the VCs that we all wish we had when we were building our own companies. Um, so I think, um, certainly on the bio and the healthcare team, 100% uh, of, of the GPs, um, the general partners have been founders in the past. And um, across our firm, I would say the vast majority, if not all um, folks have had at least you know, significant operating experience in the tech world, um, and then lots of, of ex-founders as well. So you know, that was really kind of the genesis of why Mark and Ben started this firm was, you know, at the time that they started their respective businesses, certainly at the time that I started mine in 2010, um, there really were not um, a ton of operators in the market. And more so, there were not a lot of firms who necessarily bet on the founding team to be the long run leaders of their businesses. Um, we, you know, back then you saw a lot of folks bringing in professional sort of management, you know, hired guns and replacing the founders um, you know, in the course of the growth uh, phase. So, so that was you know, fundamentally what Mark and Ben wanted to change was you know, really betting on technical founders um, for the long run leaders of the, of the companies and you know, obviously using technology as a fundamental lever in, in how these companies would scale and transform the industries that they were touching. So we very much have taken that into our healthcare franchise. Um, we, we frankly started investing in healthcare only very recently um, in, in fact, Mark actually famously declared, I think many, many years ago that he would never invest in bio and healthcare because he felt that these were two industries that were intractable with regards to the, the adoption of healthcare. And so not only did he eat his words, he um, you know, put his full heft behind uh, conviction on the fact that um, you know, not, only, not only should we be investing in, in bio and healthcare, but that we should actually have a dedicated fund 
that is entirely focused on this sector with an operating team that is also dedicated to the space. And that was really um, you know, one of the many signs of conviction that I saw as an entrepreneur when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next after stepping down from Kairos was, gosh, this is um, one of the few, if not only, tech firms that has you know, really put a ton of heft behind their dedication to the space. You tend to see a lot of toe dipping, a lot of you know, firms that claim that they do digital health and health tech investing, but don't even have a dedicated general partner who's focused on the space. Um, we're exactly the opposite, where we now have about 40 folks who are entirely dedicated to our sector. So that's um, you know, one big element of, of how we think about the world. As far as um, you know, kind of how we support our companies, we are now um, a relatively large scale operation here. We, uh, I sit personally on the early stage team where we focus on seeds and series A's for the most part, but we do have the ability through our growth vehicles to support companies for the full longitudinal you know, journeys um, that, uh, of, of the companies that we back. And I think that's relatively unique and, and novel in our healthcare space, right? It was only um, until firms like us started doing this that there, there was dedicated singular firms that um, were able to you know, continue to double down on the company that they invested in the early stages and really de-risk the, the financing strategy for the companies that they were backing. Um, so I think that's another big important part of how we've created our, our, fund, our funding vehicles. Um, and then as far as um, you know, kind of the content and the markets and the trends and the tailwinds that we uh, invest against, you know, Logan, you mentioned earlier that you had read some of our work. We're, we're pretty open about the fact that we are what I would call, you know, high conviction investors who really do the work to have a prepared mind around the specific themes in the market where we believe a massive standalone company can be built. And especially in healthcare, it is absolutely the case that that is not 100% of the areas where you think logically companies should be built, right? Um, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, categories and spaces in the market where uh, intuitively, we all believe that a better solution should and needs to exist, but the market conditions, the various regulatory factors, overall, you know, kind of appetite and maturity of existing incumbents, et cetera, prevents, you know, companies from being able to insert themselves in a way that can lead to scale. So we spend a lot of time doing um, market work and market mapping, which you um, see reflected in, in many of the pieces that we publish and many of, of the content areas that we, we do work in. So um, some of the areas and, and themes uh, most recently um, are, you know, kind of looking at the infrastructure layer of healthcare. This is an area that I have a ton of conviction around. The fact that the new operating system layer of virtual first care delivery is being built before our eyes. Um, I'm sure we'll have a chance to dive into that a little bit more as we go through this conversation. Um, primary care is another area that I think is being fundamentally redefined uh, and valued in a way that um, you know, historically has not been the case. Um, so you've probably seen a few of our recent investments uh, that, that sort of fall into that, that theme and domain. Um, and then a the last one I'll mention amongst many others that we've focused on is um, the intersection of care delivery and life sciences. Um, our team is actually sort of uniquely hybrid in, in the sense that we have folks who understand, you know, engineering, therapeutics, care delivery, and tech sort of all bundled in one. And that's a bit of my background um, as well as my partner's. And we think that one of the most underlooked and yet highly valuable spaces in the market is actually the interface between, um, you know, therapeutics and, and, and care delivery. Uh, so, you know, therapeutics companies needing to understand reimbursement and care delivery logistics far earlier in their journeys than historically has been the case. And then vice versa, care delivery companies participating in the pharmaceutical value chain in, in novel ways. Uh, Julie, you mentioned something that I want to return to. Uh, I really appreciate that overview. Uh, you talked about really finding non-intuitive opportunities, non-intuitive innovations, and things that have been overlooked. You know, and we've got a, a big group of founders here who are really trying to find um, uh, holes in the system and really fill these unmet challenges. And I wonder if you could be specific about I don't know what you see as some of those non-intuitive areas um, that that are really ripe for innovation and disruption right now in health. So I'll give you one that intuitively, uh, I'll give sort of a counter example first, and then I'll go into some of the areas where I think there's um, unintuitive um, aspects. So um, my one of my previous companies actually got acquired by a PBM. And so I found myself in the belly of the beast of a pharmaceutical benefit manager for um, a year or so. That um, you know, to me, when I when I learned more about that business and and what what those companies did, 
it was probably at the top of my list, frankly, when I, when I jumped into the VC world of areas where I'm like, holy shit, somebody needs to disrupt this thing, right? Um, in, in terms of just the opacity, in terms of the amount of capital or financial flows and transaction volume that flows through those chassis. And yet the value capture and distribution equation makes completely no sense. And so um, that is one area where, again, logically, any, any logical human being that looks at a, a PBM business model uh, will conclude that that is something that needs to be disrupted. However, it has been one of the areas that I, I would argue has been the hardest for startups to insert themselves into. You know, going directly against the belly of the beast of PBM is an extremely hard value proposition for a number of reasons. And it's unfortunately led to a whole long tail of failures um, of companies that did attempt to do that. Now, that said, I have optimism around business models that wrap around the PBM chassis and maybe over time have the opportunity to back into the surface area of a PBM, starting with more patient facing and, and perhaps provider facing uh, competencies that give them leverage over time um, that don't require, you know, the kind of the scale elements that a traditional PBM does. But that would be one example where I probably spent the first six months of my time in VC spending a substantive amount of time mapping out PBM uh, in innovation and disruption opportunities and concluded that um, there's likely not an attractable opportunity in the near term to go directly after that um, that, that center of gravity. So, so that's one example. Um, you know, I think another, I would say categorical example, and this is something that we've written about recently is, is really kind of looking at like the business models that one would think should work in healthcare. And then, you know, really unpacking why, you know, uh, something may, may or may not work and or what characteristics a business model needs to have to, to actually be viable in our space. Um, and with, you know, the third party payer system that we have, obviously there's um, a tremendous amount of complexity to that, but I, I do, I will say I'm a turnaround um, case in terms of believing in the power of direct to consumer in, in healthcare. I was um, a lifelong enterprise gal growing up in, you know, enterprise SaaS before this and, um, you know, really B2B focused businesses uh, for the most part. But I do um, gen genuinely believe in consumer, consumers, first of all, bearing more of the cost out of, out of pocket these days, um, as well as, you know, consumers actually being considered a true payer in the sense that below your deductible, you have the opportunity and the need to shop. And therefore, there is a huge, you know, chasm of, um, of opportunity for, for companies to actually insert themselves into that, that zone, where if you're just relying on kind of traditional services and, and marketplaces, you're not going to find anything, frankly, that's even affordable, let alone um, compelling from a consumer lens. So, um, so that, that's another one where I think a lot of traditional healthcare investors um, we'll look at B2C business models and write them off um, because they, you know, just simply haven't worked in the past and it are in the overall grand scheme of things, a small component of overall healthcare spend. Um, but I think we're, there's actually a number of, of examples that you can point to now that are bucking that trend that um, I think have been underappreciated in the past. You know, I want to get more into kind of how you practically work with startups that you partner with and that you invest in. And maybe a good way to do that would be to walk us through one or two of your most recent investments. I read about your uh, work with Patina Health and really kind of outlining um, why you were passionate about backing a company uh, that had a, a focus on older adults. Uh, so, so maybe you could unpack a recent investment as a way to explain kind of how you work day to day with investors through the full journey of investing in the company. Yeah, sure. Um, Patina, I think we've had like six or seven announcements in the last couple of weeks. So I'll try to pick one that um, is uh, thematic. What involved. excites so actually, you let me, let me... that you're particularly excited about? Oh, they all excite me, Logan. Um, <laughs> but uh, so one that is actually, I would say, um, highly representative of our, our core thesis about the infrastructure layer of healthcare is Sprinter Health, which we announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is a company that is basically enabling uh, last mile on demand home health services and partnering with other providers and payers to be the home health you know, enablement platform essentially for those businesses. And the core thesis here is, is twofold. One is um, the new tech stack for virtual first care is one of the big themes that we've written about where, um, you know, every, every uh, provider business, I believe, will need a home health component to their operating model, you know, especially as we get into the next phase of maturity of virtual care companies. We have now this plethora of, you know, virtual first and virtual only um, clinics that are delivering amazing services, um, you know, anywhere in the, in, the, in the country, you know, we're seeing nationwide scale with these businesses 
in a period of two to three years relative to traditional um, providers who maybe could scale to two or three states in the course of a decade, right? So it's, it's just unbelievable how, um, how fast and, and how high velocity these businesses have grown. And yet there are significant limitations to their care models by virtue of the fact that they are virtual only, right? So even if I'm sending a device to your home, um, the, you know, the ability to actually physically uh, support the patient to physically also literally see the environments within which they're living and be able to make care to care decisions personalized to those environments versus in a vacuum. Um, those are all elements that I think are going to define really the next generation of how these virtual care companies evolve. So the bet on Sprinter is that um, they will what they what they do is going to be a need for uh, literally 100% of virtual care companies, even traditional care companies that historically have been only clinic based and are needing to extend their care models into a more longitudinal relationship with the patient, um, largely driven by, by home health. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the, the premise of, of Sprinter. The, the fascinating story about this one is that we saw them um, at the seed. So we've known the company and the founders for a while. We decided not to invest in that phase because there was a proliferation of companies who had all started with a similar type of construct and business model. And we frankly just wanted to see a cycle of game film to understand what are the slight differences in the vectors that you know these companies will take that therefore would give us more signal on which ones will align most closely with our long-term thesis. And this was a company that um, within six months of their seed being raised, we um, saw you know a various number of things, one of which frankly was just the velocity with which the, the founders were able to execute that gave us conviction on um, moving in uh, for the kill, so to speak. Um, you know, in, in sort of a proactive fashion. So, um, you know, that's a great example of both uh, thesis alignment where we had a prepared mind. We had, you know, met every company in the space, um, knew exactly what we were looking for and decided not to make an investment because we didn't see the signal yet. And then on the basis of, you know, forming that long-term relationship with the founders, um, we're able to get to conviction quickly uh, based on um, just a small amount of progress that that company made um, in that space. So that's one of several examples that I can share here. Yeah, it's clearly a very uh, knowledgeable and thoughtful approach, uh, very data driven. I wonder what some of the uh, intangibles are for you when you're looking at these teams and you're really trying to decide, uh, is this a team that has the, uh, the fortitude and the mindset to withstand the, the bumps of the startup road? What, what are some of those intangibles that you look for? You know, a lot of it boils down to velocity. I think that's a word that we use a lot internally to talk about teams. and we almost assume that whatever the, especially because we're seeing a lot of companies at the seed stage, um, we just assume that like whatever they're articulating about what the company is, is going to be 80% wrong and that they're going to, you know, need to learn exactly what the form factor of the product is going to be, what the business model is going to be, um, the insertion point, um, the human labor components that all of these variables um, are things that, you know, we just know are, are complicated. And so really what we're looking for is not that they're right the first time, but more so that they, the speed of learning and willingness to um, aggregate resources in such a way that they can maximize the surface area of learning uh, in those early stages is um, is is outsized. So that, that's like a big part of you know what I care about on the team is really the velocity function. Um, how do you how do you measure that? I'm I'm curious how you gauge um, yeah. velocity in a company. Yeah, I mean this is what you, you use the word intangible. This is something that's like you know it's it's hard to quantify. Um, it's not, it's frankly not even revenue. Like I think there's obvious like metrics that are quantifiable that you, you might be looking for. Sure, that's important. And, you know, sort of number of like logos, number of patients under, under management, all, all of those things absolutely are a, I would say like a, 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 a symptom of, of someone moving more, more quickly than others. But, you know, frankly, it's, um, you know, companies, a lot of companies will send like a monthly update to their um, investors and kind of friends and family, right? The speed, you, you see the speed of learning in there where it's like, here were seven things that we hypothesized in June. And then by August, we've, we've either supported or refuted all seven of them, right? It could be the case. That it's, it's always good to, you know, both refute and support hypotheses, but, you know, that articulation of um, exactly what you proved and, and disproved um, to me is, is, is one sort of sign. Um, it's also like, you know, quality of, of talent that's being attracted to the team, right? If, if I'm blown away at the caliber of folks that are being attracted to the mission, um, you know, that's another, uh, another signal, um, especially in the early stages. And, um, and then I would say, you know, again, the, uh, this notion of sort of the ability to attract resource, 
um, some of the companies that have been the most exceptional in the early phases, you know, come to me after four months and they say, I've assembled like an advisory board of folks that just want to help us. And, um, and they all happen to be folks that I was like, oh, well, if you had asked me who, you know, I would have recommended to be advisors to your business, like those would be it. So, you know, people that, that just kind of get to the answer, um, you know, without me having to dictate it to them is, um, is another example of that. I love it. I love that idea of the velocity at which you are testing and proving or disproving your own hypotheses and then sharing that with your uh, friends, you know, friends and supporters. Um, Let's get to a few questions from the chat. We've got a number of them coming in, and I want to make sure we have time for all of them. So let's start with the top. Let's start with Edward Hinton from uh, Cancer U. Edward, you can come off a of mute, uh, explain briefly what you do, and ask your question. Sure. Thanks, Logan. Hey, Julie. Uh, yeah, Cancer U, we're an online uh, platform for cancer patients and caregivers to help empower them on their cancer journey. Uh, we're a a B to C to B company with uh, revenues coming from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, my question is, I was reading recently, I think it might've been in crunch base news about large VC firms such as yourself uh, dipping into the seed rounds with, with actual seed funds. Um, do you have any thoughts or on the, uh, what metrics you would need uh, to see or traction? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Edward, um, and congrats on what you're working on. Um, so we've always done seeds. I mean, I, I think it's a sort of a mis, um, you know misunderstood you know aspect of our like just the nature of what we've we've been doing. We've been doing seeds since day one. I think what has changed though is the definition of what is a seed, right? So these days, arguably, seeds are the new A or A or whatever it is. Yeah, so seeds are basically what A's used to be, and pre-seeds are essentially what C's used to be. So if you're talking about seeds as they stand today. Generally speaking, most of the seeds that we see have raised a pre-seed round that is akin to what a seed might have been back in the day. And for the record, my seed, when I raised um, uh, my first round at my, my previous company, Kairos, was a $500,000 check, which at the time was a huge amount of money. So um, now we're talking about orders of magnitude bigger in terms of what a seed looks like. So um, if, in fact, it is a seed that had raised a previous pre-seed that, you know, maybe let's call it one to two million dollars, um, you know, honestly, that for me, it's more about like, did the company successfully get into market full stop, right? And that gets back to the velocity equation that I, I said earlier. Metrics, sure, if you have metrics, um, we'll, we'll definitely look at them. But I, at that point, it's less about the metrics per se and more about, uh, it goes back to the hypothesis thing. Like, what were the three things that this company was seeking to prove when, or disprove when they initially went to market? And were they able to successfully you know, collect the data that they needed to, to do that. So um, that, that's kind of the framework. I would say by the time you get to your series A, that's more where we start to think about, you know, hard metrics and signs of product market fit. So that's where revenue will matter, growth will matter, um, retention will matter. And, you know, just a general understanding of the contours of the business model, both near term and long term will matter. So um, that, that's generally, Edward, how we've just, uh, kind of defined it is, is sort of seed is more about market signal and the ability to simply get to market, which again, as we all know, is not trivial in the healthcare space. And then um, at the A is really more where we start to look at metrics and signs of product market fit. Thanks for the question, Edward. Let's go to Everardo Brojas from Prescripto. Everardo, you can come off mute. Thanks, Logan. Hi, Judy. Uh, we are doing electronic prescription infrastructure for LATAM. And I think that the, the, my question ties in nicely with the past question and the changing like standards of what seed and pre-seed have been uh, in the US and especially in the Bay Area. So I know that you've been looking to invest um, in Mexico and like a seed, maybe we're like at a stage where a seed here is looks a lot like a seed in your first company, like a $500,000 check. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you see you guys investing in, in LATAM and Mexico in specific? Do you see yourselves developing like a specific knowledge of a very complex market here or applying like uh, whatever has worked in the US and trying to extrapolate it to Mexico? I love the question. And um, especially, um, so we are, I would say actively developing a thesis in LATAM and we, uh, you, you may have followed um, a lot of our FinTech teams work uh, in the region that has given us conviction on how do we think about the healthcare version of that. So um, a couple of elements of how they've been successful. One is that 
we certainly would want to partner with the local best in class VCs um, more than anything because we, we will not never claim to have on the ground expertise about you know the markets, the talent pools, entrepreneurs, et cetera, more so than folks who are on the ground who have been investing in the space. So we actually are spending quite a bit of time getting to know uh, the folks who are investing in the healthcare and digital health arena locally in the, in the Latin markets. Um, and then, you know, two, I think to your point, like it's a lot of pattern wreck, right? It's we, if we have high conviction on models that have worked here in the U.S., we're going to be more likely to have conviction on the version of that in LATAM that we um, understand at least the product and, you know, the, the go-to-market motion uh, at a high level. Um, I think, I mean, in my, in my very basic early research uh, that I've already done meeting other entrepreneurs who are building in, in the LATAM markets, um, there's a lot that I find extremely compelling about the sort of like technical leap, leapfrog opportunity, right? Like you guys are not burdened with the epic concerns of the world. Like we are here in the U.S. Um, doctors use WhatsApp to communicate with their patients. And, you know, there's a lot of um, interesting sort of like acquisition motions that I think are possible that like just wouldn't fly here in the U.S. So there are, um, you know, elements of, of, of that sort of tech leapfrog um, dynamic that we think are quite attractive uh, where, you know, models that have worked here should actually in theory work even better um, in some of those domains. So, that, long story short, um, Everett, I'd love to connect with you offline, but it, it's an area that we haven't yet made any investments. We're taking a lot of pattern rec from our colleagues in the fintech world who have been quite successful building a franchise there. And it's likely going to be a combination of partnering with local VCs and um, taking you know, our theses from the U.S. and putting a slight twist on it to make it work in those regions. L love that word, Julie, about uh, leapfrog opportunities. You know, we're backing companies in 28 different countries. And it's something that we've come back to again and again, these really special opportunities that exist um, in places like Mexico where Everardo is innovating. So we'll love to hear you hear that, say that. Um, let's go to Sanji Silva from Mockingbird. Sanji, you can come off mute and ask your question. Well, explain what you do and then ask your question. Hi, thank you. Hi, Julie. Um, so Sanji Silva from Mockingbird. Mockingbird is automating the CME process for license maintenance for, uh, for clinicians, basically. So the easiest way to put it is saying, you know, um, credentialing happens and then we come in and we have a uh, tracker that makes it easy to track all your um, maintenance uh, CME requirements and make we make it very easy to take the CME courses and track against it. So the question we have is, um, you know, we're in the process of, you know, we've started all the conversations with VCs right now for Series A. And one of the things that, uh, of course, gets asked is the MRR, ARR. You know, usually it's the 1 million in ARR um, hurdle, if you, if you will. And the nature of some of our, you know, clients um, of how they come on board is usually we have what we call a pilot or a phase one or, and a phase two, or we get maybe 30 users. And then with the potential for a hundred or sometimes even thousands of users exist, um, so we're, we're now calling that contracted revenue. Um, so the question is, is contracted revenue perceived as equal to recurring revenue from a VC perspective, or is there a discount on that? Um, and how do we get investors to get comfortable and confident in our growth projections? Yeah, awesome question. I love this because my company was also, we, we, um, we use like the car to our uh, measure. So I think that's actually something that is, has a lot of unique nuance in healthcare. And, you know, this is going to sound like a self-serving statement, but this is where I think if you have a business model like that, um, targeting healthcare specific investors who actually understand the space and B2B business models in this, in this particular domain um, is going to do you well, because um, like I totally get that dynamic. And I think it's super important to have both committed as well as um, the demonstration of the conversion path from CAR to R, right? So to answer your question, Sanji, like I think um, CAR will certainly, I don't know that discount is the right word, but we will look at CAR and R separately. And to me, the more important thing is the line of sight to conversion, right? Because um, there, there are many, many, even publicly traded companies, frankly, where the CAR to R backlog was what killed them uh, at, at scale. And so um, that, that to me is the more important piece is either whether it's conversations with your customers that can verify, like, yes, we intend to up our contracts in XYZ manner to get to that car or actual demonstrated conversion um, within your book of business that shows what the time horizon is for that conversion and the level of confidence that you can place on that conversion. So that will be my quick answer. Happy to talk more offline about it, but that's where I think it is a fairly nuanced um, concept that is kind of specific to healthcare when you're selling to these enterprises that I think it's behooves um, to, uh, 
to try to target healthcare investors who understand that dynamic. Thank you for the question, Sanji. These are uh, fantastic questions and even more are coming into the chat. So uh, we are, I'm excited to, to have all these uh, brought to you, Julie. Um, next, let's go to Raj Amin from Wise Therapeutics. Raj, you can come off mute and ask your question. Cool, yeah, hey, nice to meet you, Julie. And uh, thanks again, Logan and team. Uh, I think these conversations are really awesome. So, uh, so thanks for doing it. Uh, so just a little bit about WISE. We are focused on subconscious cognitive training through casual games. We're in the PDT space. And so uh, coming out of the health conference, it was clear to see there's a lot of focus. There's actually a whole track on PDTs. So that was great to see. Um, besides evidence, which is obviously at the core of PDTs, what else are you looking for when you're looking at companies in the space? What else do you want to see in terms of traction outside of just the clinical evidence? You know, a couple of things there. One is uh, certainly the clinic. I mean, I would actually emphasize the clinical evidence, which I think is something that doesn't surface itself enough in diligence processes. Like we care deeply about clinical rigor here on our team. We actually have two clinicians on our team. We have research scientists on our team. We will dig into the work and read the papers, um, so to speak. And, um, you know, like you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't be surprised <laughs> at how many companies don't have that evidence base, but um, that is something that is super critical. Um, so that, that's one piece. You know, we do spend a, a lot of time with, you know, folks from the sort of the FDA domain, the regulatory side of the house mm -hmm. to understand how they're thinking about the space, right? Because the other, the other mantra that we have is, um, you know, we, we, we we're constantly blown away by how many new ideas there are in digital health and, and other markets in general. But the, the reality is, is that the market can only absorb a certain number of new ideas in a given period of time. And it's, you know, that that's a big part of our job is figuring out what is that, the timing of, you know, these things that again, seemingly should exist, but, you know, the, the system needs to be able to absorb them in, um, in, a, in a time horizon that makes sense for our investment, um, you know, kind of mandate. So mm -hmm. that's another area where we spend a lot of time with, with the market and, you know, whether it's payers, whether it's FDA, whether it's employers, if, you know, if, if you're going down that route, um, really mapping out like what are the one or two key categories that we think will emerge in the next 18 to 24 months that um, you know would would give us confidence or not give us confidence that you know this is a this is the right kind of company to bet on in, in that particular space. So yeah. those are just a couple of elements that, yeah. that come to mind. That's great. Do you how high do you prioritize say pharma relationships or kind of commercial agreements relative to evidence in that context? Um, super important. I think it's um, because the space in general is so nascent. Um, Having both would frankly put you ahead of the pack in many ways. Sure. Um, so I would say absolutely critical, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of timing. And if companies are able to crack those two nuts uh, in parallel in the early stages, I think that's a pretty strong marker of, um, of performance. Awesome. Thank you. Raj, thank you for the question. Uh, we're just gonna keep it rolling in the chat. We've got a question from Peter Aryan from Juna. Uh, a recent addition, uh, as with uh, Raj Amin, to the Startup Health Portfolio. Uh, Peter, awesome to have you on. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. It's an honor to meet you, Julie. Um, so I'm the founder of Juna. We provide at-home SDI testing and behavioral health support for Gen Zers and the LGBTQ plus community, which we believe is an extremely underserved market. Uh, our focus is prep testing, which uh, we're in network with Kaiser Medicare and Medicaid for the state of California. Um, I was just wondering, what are your biggest interests for consumer health? Obviously, with the twenty with the twenty three and Me acquisition of Lemonade Health, huge game changer. Um, you know, where do you see that path going with other companies like Ancestry um, coming in? Do you think that you know what areas interest you the most in the space? And what do you look for in founders personally? Like what are the, some of the things that stick out to you the most? Nice to meet you, Peter. And I've heard a lot of, uh, you guys have generated quite a bit of buzz around your company, so congrats. Thank you. Um, so I think, I mean, what, one, one, one sort of dimension of companies that I think are showing uh, quite a bit of success actually are, are those that are in, this, in the domain that you're operating in. So areas where there's like a social stigma associated with a service that um, otherwise is available in the traditional healthcare system, but requires you to expose yourself or be vulnerable in a way that's not, um, you know, socially acceptable. 
So, um, or not, not acceptable per se, but just challenging. So I think that's where, I mean, Roe is obviously the obvious example where, um, you know, starting with ED and um, hair loss and things of that mm -hmm. sort, um, gave them a wedge into a tremendous circuitry of other things that they can get into once they earn the trust with their initial set of users. So that's, um, you know, one large zone. The other thing is, um, I think now I mentioned earlier, just kind of with, pay, with consumers increasingly becoming a major payer class in and of themselves, and the access issues related to basic low acuity services, and the fact that so many of these basic low acuity services can now be delivered in a cost effective fashion that's like a no brainer to pay out of pocket for large swaths of the population. I think those are areas where, again, we might not just underwrite to that core, core product, so to speak, um, for the long run, you know, kind of vision of the business, but as an entry point, if you're able to demonstrate engagement with a very basic, you know, kind of low cost product, um, you know, that's another area where um, we see a huge amount of opportunity. I see Jeff uh, here on the phone with Salvo, like that's, that's a lot of what um, is exciting about what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, a last piece is kind of almost on the opposite end of the stick where you have super high acuity areas where people are already so desperate and therefore willing to pay large amounts of, of money out of pocket, um, you know, either themselves or through foundations, you know, getting like grants and such uh, governance, uh, government assistance, um, where there's just a huge amount of friction to the payment model. So, you know, the example that I always use here is like autism care. I have a, I have a family member affected by this and the length to which their family will go to get good, good care for their child is unbelievable. And if we can just make it like an iota of a, of a fraction of a, you know, care easier for these folks to get reimbursement, you know, that is available, but just today has so many hoops to jump through. Um, I think that's another example where the acquisition motion might be D to C, but the value proposition would be how do you help those consumers actually get access to reimbursed services versus having to pay out of pocket. So those are three examples, Peter, that come to mind. Um, but I would say like categorically though, this is, as I mentioned earlier, an area that like I had not fully appreciated how much um, surface area there was of opportunity today, you know, versus something that maybe is on the come in the future. And I, I'm, I'm super, we're, we're super excited about it here and, and spending a lot of time in this uh, domain. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for the uh, the question, Peter. Everyone's asking such great questions today that you're making my job very, very easy. Um, all right, let's go to a question from Lawrence from Avo MD. Lawrence, if you want to hop off mute, you can go ahead. Hi, um, <clears throat> we're Avo MD. Um, we're creating no code um, uh, modular clinical decision support, so we can integrate into any HR or completely work standalone. Um, I was wondering, and I think you touched upon this um, previously, but really just going from C to Series A um, and look, thinking about metrics, right? I think someone mentioned that $1 million um, ARR mark for the typical enterprise SaaS company. Um, do you think that threshold exists for you know, a lot of health tech companies, especially provider facing ones? Um, and kind of part two to the question is like, what other kind of quantitative metrics do you look at to help validate your hypothesis that there's a product market fit? So I would say if you, um, first of all, I'm a big fan of the type of product that you're building. And I think that's, you know, one of the areas that um, benefits from looking a lot like, you know, other kind of SaaS, like traditional enterprise SaaS products, because I think your, the universe of venture firms that you can tap into is much larger than if you're like a tech enabled service or something much more esoteric that um, non-healthcare investors won't be able to grok. So, um, so in that sense, I think you, you know, it, it is probably more akin to kind of traditional enterprise SaaS metrics that will be used to assess your business. These days, given what I said earlier about the dynamics on what a series A even is, the, the uh, progress um, of companies um, at the series A, we're seeing like we, we've done, we've run some data. It, it's generally earlier than what it's been in the past. So I would say the expectation these days is that it doesn't have to be a million. It's actually a lot of companies are far earlier than that because just the rounds are getting more aggressive. Um, that said, I mean, for me, again, it's about derivative function more so than absolute numbers. So I think growth in, you know, over what period of time is, is more the, like the slope of that, of that line is, is more what we look at. Um, you know, TAM matters in the sense that, you know, for a given, especially with something like a, like a um, infrastructure uh, play, like, like what you're building, it's not clear that like every company will have an engineering team that will be able to absorb, you know, that product. So what do we need to believe um, for the, the core market in terms of 
absorption factor, so to speak, um, you know, before you get to your next act. And um, depending on how long you've been around, you know, I think the, the, the LTV equation is another thing that we'll definitely like look at either numbers wise or like model out in terms of, you know, what we need, again, what we need to believe in, for the funnel to work um, on a unique economic basis in the long run, because if you're selling to, you know, small business, quote unquote, like other digital health companies, you know, churn, we'll just expect that churn is high. And so, you know, we'll have to have conviction on ACV and, you know, how much revenue you think you can extract from the given logo, um, you know, versus, um, you know, relative to, to what we think that churn metric will look like. So those are the types of things that we would, again, either look at the data that you have or model out to make sure that we can get to conviction. So I think it's a little bit of a, like sort of a lazy red herring to say like there's just one singular static number like a 1 million ARR you know threshold that people would claim to make a decision on so I would I would view that as a, a flag that perhaps there's another reason at play if, if you hear that um, you know for me again it's more about the, the longitudinal equation over time and where that leads thanks for the question Lawrence uh, lazy red herring I'm gonna have to steal that one joy I like that <laughs> Uh, let's go to Sydney Collin from Deoro Devices. Uh, Sydney, why don't you come off mute? Hi, Julie. Thank you for being here. Um, at Deoro Devices, we create non-invasive mobility aids that allows the aging population to be able to stay active and mobile at home safely. Uh, and so my question for you, you spoke a little bit about your experience with direct-to-consumer uh, in the healthcare space earlier, and I wanted to dive deeper into that. Um, and understand if there are certain patterns that you've noticed in what types of companies succeed in direct consumer and which types don't in healthcare specifically, medical device versus software um, versus services. And is there a price threshold that marks what consumers are willing to pay out of pocket or what, again, types of products or services consumers are willing to pay out of pocket for versus they're still expecting uh, CMS or other insurers to pay for? Yeah, I would say, I mean, that is actually the type of question that we would gem with the entrepreneur on, right? Because um, we would assume that you guys know a thousand times more about the market than we do. And, you know, we do ask, like, what are the comps in the space that people are already paying for that you think are good indicators of a willingness to pay around this kind of service? Or, um, you know, Edward mentioned the B2C to B motion earlier, which we're, we're, we also are, are big believers in. How, to what degree have you been able to articulate that the B2C motion is a path to a potential downstream reimbursement rail or you know, other um, subsidization mechanism? And, what the, and working backwards from that, like what does that need to look like? So um, that's another you know, sort of flavor of that. Um, so yeah, I guess my short answer, Sydney, would be that like talking through this question and understanding to what degree has the entrepreneur gone through the idea maze of figuring out and even validating doing tests, right? Like these days, it's so easy to spin up a test on Facebook and, you know, get people to um, drive to a landing page to validate whether or not they'd be willing to engage in a product that is priced in different ways and, you know, sort of run a, like an AB, ABC test, um, you know, all the way to looking at other established net. We, we actually now finally have like other, you know, healthcare uh, cash pay uh, uh, benchmarks that we can look to that we didn't have before. So, um, yeah, to me, it's less about like an exact absolute threshold. Um, it's more about the process by which you unearth what is the likely, um, you know, price point and how does that then tie to a longer term business model if that's what in fact you're doing. I think it's, you know, to double click on what I said earlier, um, I, I actually, I meet with like Z at Row is a great example of this where I think it's going to be inevitable that at some point, if he continues to expand his business model the way that he envisions expanding it, he will have to tap into reimbursement, even though he, you know, always, always says that he's never going to do that. Um, so, you know, th that's the kind of, you know, kind of vector that we want to be able to see is, um, is this a category that is reimbursed? If not, and that is, you know, something that you intend to do over time, what, what gives you conviction that, that that path exists? Like, have you had payer conversations? Is there, you know, some research that you've um, looked at that makes the, the economic case that payers would be, should be willing to, to reimburse for this? Um, so, you know, level of, of, of sophistication around that answer set is, is probably where, where we start. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Sydney. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to roll up a couple of our questions uh, that are on similar themes. Uh, we've got two questions, two, two people, uh, Sasha Heppel and Vitaly 
uh, from Pig Pug uh, both want to know about your um, willingness to invest in devices and med tech versus uh, sort of an understanding that Andreessen Horowitz focuses on software oriented products. Yep, um, great question. We we do so. What we don't invest in is where the hardware itself. Um, you know, I guess let me let me say this a different way. The what we care about is the like the leverage that you get out of software type businesses, right? The ability to iterate quickly, the ability to um, you know to scale, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's less that we don't invest in hardware. It's more that if your if your business has a hardware component to it. Uh, how do you um, not be bottlenecked by the product development process that typically is much more monolithic with hard hardware versus a software component? We do actually have a number of, of companies that have you know hardware in their model, um, whether it's you know um, like Nautilus is a company that went public that has an actual device. Um, Levels is a you know metabolic health company that uses CGM. So in those businesses, we got the conviction that the software layer of what they're doing is really where the core IT is and what drives, you know, the innovation, um, you know, kind of roadmap for the, the future lines of, of products and lines of business versus the device itself being kind of the standalone product. So um, it's not a hard no, it's more just how, what is the role that hardware is playing in your business model? Appreciate it. Okay. There, we also have two questions from Andrew Garza and Ismail from uh, Innovarex about your interest in uh, investing in African opportunities. Um, well, why don't I go ahead and invite uh, Andrew to represent the two questions So you were the first to, to drop this. Andrew, why don't you come off mute and, um, and go ahead and explain. Cool. Um, th thanks, Julie. Th thanks, Logan. Uh, so I'm, I'm Andrew from Life Stores Healthcare. Uh, we are trying to democratize access to, to quality primary healthcare in uh, different parts of Africa, starting in Nigeria. Um, we've started out uh, in the pharmacy space since that's where most people go for their, their primary healthcare needs um, by providing a, a marketplace that lets pharmacists buy quality medications. We also give them software to run their businesses. Um, so uh, questions for you were one around um, your interest in healthcare opportunities in Africa, and then two, and uh, you know, only if time allows, and I'll, I'll defer to you on this, Logan, but uh, your interest in, in marketplace um, opportunities in, in the healthcare space. So on the first question, uh, yeah, no, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, I think similar kind of a mindset and approach to what we said earlier about LATAM in general, haven't made any investments yet outside of the US, very intellectually curious about markets in which there are these sort of like leapfrog opportunities and where there's pattern wreck on the types of companies and businesses that can be built relative to our core theses here in the US. Um, would frankly love to be educated by you, Andrew. We haven't spent as much time in Africa as we have in, in LATAM, so we'd be happy to connect with you offline to learn more. Um, and then on your second question about marketplaces, um, I love marketplaces. I've grown up in a number of what, you know, if you unpack the core product, ultimately we're marketplace type businesses. There, I mean, a lot of the big businesses in legacy healthcare one could describe as a marketplace, right? I mean, I mentioned PBMs before, like what is PBM but a two-sided marketplace? Um, you know, GPOs, um, you know, clearinghouse companies, these are all marketplace businesses at the end of the day. So I think um, I'm very bullish on that. I think probably the, the distinct difference in opportunity set these days is that you can have consumer facing dimensions to it that probably weren't, you know, um, existent before. So I do think that there's a huge opportunity. I'm I, my company actually grew up next to ZocDoc, which was, you know, arguably one of the first sort of consumer facing marketplaces in healthcare. I'm a huge fan of what they did. They were kind of pseudo competitors to my company. So it was kind of fun to grow up next to them. I, I still think there's a lot of, you know, run room on models like that because it's kind of crazy to believe that we've had such an explosion of virtual care options in the last couple of years and yet no single place to go like shop for them in a way that also respects your insurance coverage and you know other factors that are um, esoteric to the space. So I, I would I think we will like, likely see the emergence of more and more of those kinds of players um, in the out years. All right, awesome question. Um, let's just keep rolling. Let's just keep, let's get to as many of these uh, questions in the chat as we're, as we're able to, Julie. Uh, this is great, such good questions. Uh, Jean Ann uh, from Unali Ware, Jean Ann Booth, why don't you come off mute and ask your question? Hey, Julie, I'm Jean Ann Booth. Uh, we have an Apple Watch for seniors. And um, I, I, was, I was interested because when you were talking about, you know, the intuitive and non-intuitive technologies, you could see 
tech, which is what I call the technologies for those of us who are a little older, as both intuitive and non-intuitive. And, and so I'm really interested in, in you know, Anderson Horowitz's perspective, because there's over a billion people worldwide above the age of 65, 56 million of us in, in the US alone. So what are your thoughts on silver tech? Senior care is, is a core thesis um, that we've invested against in multiple companies. Um, you know, Devoted is an interesting company where, where uh, it's a Medicare Advantage, you know, full stack Medicare Advantage plan, pay vider type model with an integrated, a vertically integrated care model um, in its core as well. They've actually partnered with Apple Watch and many other device players to make that a core benefit, um, you know, that they will literally give to, for free to their members because they see the clinical economic benefit of, of the remote monitoring component. So um, we have a number of examples in our portfolio that have embraced that, which, you know, is a reflection of our excitement about the space in general. I think, um, the, I mean, the other only other comment, which kind of goes without saying is like, I think there there had been a bit of a freeze on the space from an investor lens because of the assumption, erroneous as it is, that um, you know seniors' um, willingness and capable, you know, competency to use these devices in their home was lower than it definitely you know has shown to be, especially during the pandemic. So I think that you know that's probably an assumption that's been thrown out the window at this point, hopefully by most. Um, so you know we we definitely um, you know all have a strong belief that that's that's not the case. Um, the last thing I'll say is, I, you know, the, a lot of how we, we view investments in general is looking at like the reimbursement tailwinds and to what degree is this something that is actually being reimbursed in a mainstream fashion. I think the fact that you are seeing so many traditional Medicare Advantage plans now, um, you know, make these types of devices available to their membership as part of a supplemental benefit is um, a huge uh, positive sign that, you know, this is kind of, it's here to stay. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll take it back to the comment I made earlier about how we view hardware. Like, I think we would bet on the basis of the software layer of that kind of product being a long run, you know, leverage point for the business more so than the device itself. And, and you know, ideally um, a, a high, a compelling roadmap for how that device itself evolves over time. But um, those are some, some high level thoughts. Thanks for the question, Jeannie. And I think we're going, to tr we're going to try to squeeze in one more question while, while that's being asked by Jim Fang from Fixable. Be thinking about if you've got a sort of greatest insight that you'd like to reflect back to the group about what you've heard today. Uh, there's been a lot. A lot of wisdom has been shared. So drop uh, your, your name in the chat if you'd like to share even a one-liner of something you took away uh, as a way to sort of share that knowledge with the group. So Jim Fang from Fixable, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, on the clock, you've got a you've got a minute or less. All right, give me a quick one. <laughs> My name is Jim uh, from Fixable. We're a pain prevention platform. We utilize um, artificial intelligence and, and augmented reality to get people out of pain, prevent, and better human performance. Quick question for you: um, What do you think about uh, slightly moderate competing products within your portfolio? And do you is that a hard no for you guys, or is that something you kind of like? Ah, oh, they're kind of in the same field, but let's let the best one um, battle it out. We, we think about this a lot, obviously, because we have um, the privilege of working with such ambitious entrepreneurs that they all want to do everything eventually. So um, it's, a, it's a first class problem to have. So the way that we look at it, we actually have like a pretty sophisticated grid that we use to evaluate like when, when there is some concern about it um, in a way that is entirely transparent, by the way, to both founders. Like if you know, we, we very early in the process, if we feel like we're at all going to be leaning in, um, we want to have that conversation early. And um, transparently using actual, you know, sort of like uh, hard evaluation criteria. The, I would say that the one thing that probably drives the majority of it is the go to market. If you are two products that are competing for the same budget and are likely to be in a situation where someone has to choose between either using you or something else, that, that would definitely make it challenging. There's plenty of examples where the same exact product is actually being sold into very, very different channels where you know, seemingly on the surface, it might look like a competitive investment, but um, based on that analysis, we don't think that they will ever, you know, in the near term at least, compete directly head to head. Um, all that said, you know, at the end of the day, we can only have visibility into what's on their roadmap. Like we actually do, we have the test of like, if there is a ticket in your JIRA backlog that dictates that you will do X, Y, Z, then sure, we're gonna give you credit for it. But if not, like all bets are off because every company, you know, um, evolves so quickly. So um, within that that scope, if we you know if we see uh, a challenge, then you know we'll we'll walk away. But um, 
you know, beyond that, we it's hard, it's always hard to predict, you know, where, where companies are heading. So we don't we don't wring our hands too much about things beyond sort of that that one year time horizon. That's great. The go to market strategy makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Great question, Jim. Uh, lightning round, a minute and a half for uh, greatest insights. I'm going to go to uh, Raj Amin first from Wise Therapeutics. Go. From the DTX side, what I heard was focus on evidence, real evidence, <laughs> clinical evidence, and uh, early commercial partnerships that validate your approach. Yeah, love it. Love it. And what I'm taking away here is this idea that you assume that a new startup is going to be 80% wrong. And so what you're really looking for is the intelligence of the team, their adaptability, their ability to create hypotheses and prove them out or, or, or disprove them and to grow and change over time. I thought that was very helpful, something that I will be carrying with me. Um, hey, Everyone, fantastic session. That's the top of the hour. Uh, I want to end on time. Uh, everyone asked great questions. Uh, Julie, I think I speak for everyone when I say we really appreciate you taking the time with us, taking a, a round robin uh, series of questions about a number of topics. Uh, we will be connecting you to a few folks that uh, you talked to during the call and just appreciate your, uh, just your transparency and willingness to, to share your, your passion and your knowledge. Thank you guys so much. Awesome questions. And uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me to uh, continue the dialogue.